Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for his opportunity to stand before you all one more time. Um, without much of an introduction, I have a lot of things to cover today, so I'm going to go jump right into it. Um, if you can go to that first slide, um, just going to remind everybody where we're at. We've been, we're almost near the end of the series that we've been covering for several months now. And we're in the last section of the series we've called The New and Living Way. We spoke about the various new uh, aspects of this new way that God brought about with his sacrificial death on the cross. Talked about the new covenant, the new birth, new heart, new fruit, new family, new purpose. And we're now in the new heaven and new earth. Uh, we started this topic a couple of weeks ago. This is the third message on this topic, and uh, well, I actually kicked off this part of the message, and uh, when I spoke last, talked about how, um, actually, if you'll just go to the next slide, I'll just kind of remind everybody where we're at. So if you remember, uh, we talked about that Genesis 1 and 2 describes how God created everything that is existing in the seen world from time past until his coming back, right? So creation, and then there's a big chasm or a big valley between Genesis 2 and Revelations 21 and 22 when we see uh, the description of the new heaven and new earth or what we call new Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ coming down. Between this chasm, you know, there are all the stories of the Bible that we see, the prophets, and the Old Testament saints and the gospel, all of the things that have happened in the world in between those two times are described between these first two chapters and the last two chapters. Last time I spoke, I described how uh, compared the analogy of a train where the whole world or through history is like you're on a train and each boxcar or bogey, as you might call it in India, is, represents whether it's your social class or the time you're born in. It doesn't matter. You might be born rich or poor. It just means you're in a different boxcar. Either way, everybody who's been born in this world or on this train are headed to the bottom of this chasm, which is uh, not good, <laughs> right? So unless there is an intervention, uh, there is no good end to those who are born in this world. And God himself intervened and sent his son to die on the cross to save those that trusted in his name and redeem the church for himself, pulled us out of this train that was headed for destruction and gave us an inheritance in New Jerusalem, right? So we spoke about that last time. That is our hope, that we believe that God did that for us and we trust in him, that he will come back to rescue us physically because the actual redemption of our body has not happened yet, Right? So he's going to rescue us from this train headed for destruction, which the whole world is on this train, whatever century you were born in. And so he rescued us, and the actual physical act of res that re final rescue happens at the rapture, or if you are dead, when you are raised alive to be part of the church uh, in, in, new, in the New Jerusalem. Right? So, uh, so if you'll go to the next slide, uh, Minu covered this. Um, real quick, uh, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. There's so much you can talk about this. There's a lot of disagreements and arguments when things happen, but generally I believe everybody agrees that these are the things that happen uh, you know, from now, which is the church age, uh, until kind of this time in the new heaven and new earth. So there is a time of the tribulation, and then there's a millennial uh, reign of Christ for a thousand years where he and the church will reign on the earth, the kingdoms of the earth that exist at the time. But God's kingdom will be physically established in the world at that time, right? And then there's a great white throne judgment of Christ, which I'll hit in a second. And then finally, the new heaven and new earth, which we call as eternity. So um, again, my, I only put that up just to remind everybody the timeline and that, you know, there's no time today to cover all of that. What I want to cover is this fact um, that there will be a time 
where what you call, and you can go to the next slide, which there will be a judgment of everything that was created. Whether you were in Christ or you were not in Christ. So, and that is my topic today, is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. First of all, we, when we hear judging, judgment, and all these things, uh, we have different connotations that come up in our mind. And, um, you know, if you look at the definition of judgment, there's kind of broadly two ways you can think about it. One is, you know, you uh, evaluate something and you decide something is good or bad, right? So you say, you know, uh, I want to buy this car or this car or electric car or gasoline car, it doesn't matter. Okay, I may formed a judgment in my head and I made a decision, right? That's one form of judgment. Another one is where somebody's committed a crime, they stand before an authority like a judge, and that judge pronounces a judgment upon that person based on the laws of the land to say, you have committed this crime, now you must pay the punishment, right? So, um, and there's much talk about this today because we are all, uh, you know, have an aversion to being judged, right? We might ourselves might have a view of what our failings and our shortcomings are, but when somebody points that to us, uh, we say, hey, whoa, don't judge me, bro, right? We say, don't, don't judge me, and we say, Jesus said, don't judge not that you be not judged, right? But then later again it says, but judge righteous judgments. So, uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to get into all of that, but the point is, there is a concept of judgment. And the new heaven and new earth cannot and will not happen until you go through judgment. Okay, every, that's why it says, um, it, and I'll read this later, every creature, every, everyone, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So God will judge and determine what somebody's future estate or condition is based on their life on earth while they were alive. And so first question to come ask is, the reason somebody says, don't judge me, is because we say, who are you to judge me? You don't know anything about me, right? The first question we have to answer is, what authority does Christ have to judge, right? Or why do we accept the judgment from an earthly court? Because what? They were counterworthy of, a, of being a judge because they were counter uh, knowledgeable about the laws of the land. They went through training and all of that, and they finally elected or appointed to be a judge, right? So, so even more than that, Christ is worthy to judge us because of who he is, right? Because he is God and he sees everything in complete nakedness, right? So when we stand before Christ, or anybody stand before Christ, there is no question about the veracity of the claim that is made against us or for us. There is no question or need of proof because Everything is laid naked before his eyes, and he sees not only what you did, the reason why you did something. He sees the counsel and the intentions of, of everything that was done or said before you even said it, right? So Christ, that's what the imagery you see in Revelation chapter 5, which, um, which is the uh, which is the kind of the scene where God's judgment is unleashed physically in the world. So, and there is this, I'll come to that in a second, but before that, you see the scene in Revelation chapter 5, it's the scene in heaven, and you can see that there is a book with many seals on it, and there is nobody worthy to open the seals. So, the the book contains the judgment that God has for the world, right? You have all the judgments that are laid out with the seals and the trumpets and the vials and bring about such unbelievable uh, calamities upon the inhabitants of the world. But nobody is counted worthy to 
enact that judgment. And then they see the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And who is Christ? Who, as it says in Hebrews, the captain of our salvation was made perfect through his obedience. Through his perfect life on earth. Through his sacrificial death on the cross. Because he, could, he fulfilled what Adam could not do. The last Adam was perfect, whereas the first Adam failed. Right? So he was counted worthy to judge. So we will not be judged by a God who is not, uh, un, uh, you know, who has not been in our place. We will be judged by a God who took the form of a human. Just like, you know, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he, when he came down uh, as a human, we will be judged who took the form of a human. So no, word, no mouth shall be able to say, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know what I've been through. Oh no, he's been through that. Been there, done that. And he overcame, and he lived a perfect life. And he will be worthy, he is worthy, to judge and cast the perfect judgment. Amen? So, so we see the sign, I don't have, and, and you'll see, and, and, and if you, re, you can read the same imagery in Revelation 1, uh, Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 10, very similar imagery. Because the judge, Christ that you will see at that time is not the Christ on the cross. See, we make a mistake because when we think about Christ, we think about a weak Christ who is still on the cross. Uh-uh. He is not on the cross anymore. He defeated death and he ascended into glory and where he dwells currently in glory on the right hand of the Father. Amen? So he is, so even John who's witnessed the crucifixion, he, he was out of breath. He could not talk when he saw the true glory of Christ in Revelation 1. And his eyes burning as fire, which represents the eyes that see everything into the core of your being. And his uh, hair as, as snow and feet as burning brass and uh, girded with a, you know, per, uh, 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 with a linen cloth and golden, uh, a golden girdle. Um, and his voice was like the sound of many rushing waters. So the same image you can see in Daniel who had the same experience in Revel Daniel chapter 10 when he saw Christ in this form, he was speechless. He he was like, I, I can't, I am without strength. So, as says, John says uh, in 1 John, will we be able to stand confidently and boldly before him when we stand before him? There is no question as to whether, whether we will stand before him. Everybody, born as a human being, will stand before Christ. The question is, are we, will, will we be confident at his coming that we will not be ashamed. Okay, so this is a question we must think to ourselves. So I'll just hit quickly the, uh, that was the first point on there. The second point, the judgment of the world. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I will say this in Revelation chapter uh, 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works not based on guessing or assumptions. They were judged based on their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Um, so, and John, Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 17, this is the con uh, condemnation that the light was come into the world and people loved darkness more than the light and they rejected the light. See, we were born, when we were born, we were condemned already, right? It's not after we were born, we, no, if we were already condemned, we merely had to accept 
the salvation that God is offering, the grace that he's offering, right? So the judgment is that we rejected this offer of help, the offer to pull us out of this pit, the offer of to, uh, to avoid this judgment because everybody whose book name was not in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is a judgment. There's a great famous sermon, uh, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a man called Jonathan Edwards a couple of centuries ago preached this uh, in a calm voice. And people, when they realize that uh, the, the, the greatness and the terribleness of God's judgment, uh, I mean, they were, people fainted, they ran out, they could not take this message, it was too heavy for them. But yeah, again, I'm trying to say this in a calm voice because it's not an emotional thing. It's a truth that is black and white. That is day and night, that everybody who's born as a human being will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the righteous judge, Christ in his glory, will determine what we will be um, based on our works. So while there is time, if anybody listening to me has not accepted his offer of salvation, I encourage you to, to look into this, to change your mind to explore the grace that Christ is offering freely. There are some that teach there's only a few people that are uh, you know, uh, meant to be called or there's an elect, there's a certain number God has ordered. No, what the Bible says is the door is open to anybody who accepts the grace of Christ. You have until even uh, King Ahab, after he betrayed Naboth to take the vineyard and God was said, I'm going to, you're going to destroy you. The dogs are going to lick your blood where they, na- they lick the blood of Naboth. And Ahab humbled himself. And, and he put sackcloth and he humbled himself before God. And God said, look how he humbled himself. I will not produce his judgment upon him. If God forgave Ahab for that, there, he, who was the worst king that Israel had, God can forgive anybody. This grace is available to anybody who is willing to accept it. This is the great weight that should be upon our heart when we think about the gospel of Christ. Amen? You all with me? Amen. I didn't mean to bring a uh, somber mood. Um, uh, is it, okay, so one more thing, and I'll, uh, you sh- I'll encourage you to read Ezekiel chapter 14, um, the kind of the second half of it, it, how it talks about in a city, even if there's Job, Daniel, and Noah, and everybody else is wicked, that city will not be saved. He will pull Job, Daniel, and Noah out before that city is destroyed, is what God is saying. So, the, the great tribulation will happen. The judgment of God will happen in its due course. We don't have to worry about when, but it will happen. Just like Job, Daniel, and Noah, God will pull out of the church in time to fulfill his judgment. We don't have to worry about the times and seasons. We just have to get ourselves ready. But we have to remember, just because it says their sons will not be saved, only they themselves. Your parents won't be saved because you are righteous. Only those who are righteous. It is an individual judgment, not a collective or national judgment. Right? You all with me? Okay, I got my time's almost up, actually. I'm only halfway through. So, um... The last point on this slide, judgment of the church. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, if someone can help me reading that, actually, verse 10. In English, if you don't mind. Okay, if you'd stay in that um, place, and then if we can read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, uh, 13 through 15.
And if you can read one more verse, that uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Uh, four, 4, verse 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 and 5. Amen. So, so first thing you read in that Second Corinthians passage was that, and now Paul is saying we must all appear. Before. This is Paul, the apostle himself. He is not excluding himself and saying, "Look at what all I've done. I am now excused." He's saying we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone will receive the things done in his body what he has done, whether it's good or bad. So this is saying even the church, not as a church, IPC Hebron together, or any church gathering together, individually, not as a family, you don't, you know, it's like when you go through uh, the airport, um, you know, they, they call the family together and check your uh, passport or tickets, right, or boarding pass. No, you don't get to go up together, you go up individually, right? Everyone must stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what we did, whether it was good or bad, rewards according to that. So then you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, that the day will declare it, it will be revealed by fire. Fire shows the judgment of Christ. And we will try every man's work of what sort it is, whether it is gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. And the last verse is important, that verse 15. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if you remember that uh, example of the train, you know, in, in this world, you buy a train ticket, you get on the train, it'll take you to the destination. Unfortunately, the gospel is not the same. You don't get to punch your ticket and just do what you want and then, you know, think you'll receive, reach your destination. God is expecting us to live, that's what we've been talking about this whole time, right? To bear fruit for him. Live a life that is worthy of his calling. To live in wisdom, to live in the way, why, for the reason that he called you, right? So I imagine this, this way, just like, you know, we all bring our stuff and God puts it through the fire. So if what you did while you were alive was made of gold and silver, it'll shine even brighter, Right? Gold and silver shines even brighter in the fire, right? And people will see and praise God for the life these people led, whoever that is, right? If what you did, because uh, it says in verse chapter 4, verse 5 that you read, that it will reveal the counsel, even the reason why you did certain things. So, you know, if, if the light, you, uh, if you lived on this world and you, uh, le- you know, did all these things to show people, uh, you know, a public kind of display, but in secret, you had nothing to do with the things of God. You didn't abide in His presence. You didn't have a private prayer life. You had no connection to God. I believe it will be like this wood and hay that as soon as you put it in the fire, it will be burnt up. And it says, yes, you might be saved yourself, but all the things you work for in this world will be burnt away. Amen. So you might see many men, prominent people who you looked up to in this world. And wow, look at those men and women of God. They work tirelessly. They will also put their house into the fire. We don't know what it will look like. Only the fire of God's judgment will determine whether it was done with the fruit of the Spirit or not. Right? So we have to judge for ourselves. While we have the breath in our nostrils, what we are, whether what we're doing is in the, spi- uh, in, in the wisdom and the spirit of God. But sometimes, uh, but some of you, nobody knows what, you, what life you lead. And people think, well, look at that person. I don't know what they're leading. But in your private life, you are growing and transforming into the image of Christ. You might not be on stage. You are doing what God has called you to do faithfully. 
whether as a husband, as a wife, as a child, student, whatever you're doing, you're doing faithfully unto God without no man knowing, and you put that your house through the fire, and you will find that it is shining as gold, brighter than anything else, because God judged your work to be faithful. You are faithful until the very end. You are not swayed by all the wind of doctrine. You didn't go to this and that, but you stayed steady until the very end. That is of much value before God. And I believe that will be rewarded. Amen? So we cannot think of judgment. I can't, uh, I, my time is up. I have to cover one more point. Uh, uh, we cannot think of judgment in a way that we, look, it's not like, you know, uh, our Sunday school anniversary. You know, you learn five verses, you come up on stage, everybody gets a consolation prize, and parents are happy, the kids are happy. It's not like that. It's not what we imagine it to be. So don't measure heavenly things by our earthly understanding. Okay? We cannot judge as man judges. Study the scriptures to see what God values. You say, see, man, we judge people by their gifts, right? We see people uh, prophesying or healing, and we judge those as men, great men of God, but they bear no fruit. But God says, I will judge you by the fruit. Do you have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness? When I look at you, do I see my, the nature of my son, Christ, in you? That's how God judges, not by your actions or words. It is the fruit that you've borne for him. It is the fruit that God is judging. Amen? So, last slide. Um, so this, uh, and I'm going to read one more passage. Uh, Daniel chapter 12. Two, three, and four. Uh, two and three. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So this is what we're saying after we go through the fire of God's judgment. You know, that will reveal what we will be. It's saying those who are wise will shine as the brightness of the clouds. Amen? Our works on earth will determine how we shine. I believe, just like I was saying, the anniversary example, it's not this cash price or anything like that, right? I believe our, uh, what we are in eternity, as John says, we don't know what we'll be like in John chapter um, uh, 3, verse 2. But when we see him, we will be like him. I believe that in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I'm kind of skimming through some deep concepts here, but... There's one star and another star. The glory of each star is different. I believe that our glo- each one's glory is different based on what judgment we receive. I believe that's the reward we receive. What we will be in eternity will be based on what we do today. So we will shine as the brightness of the stars depending on how we pass through the judgment. So this is what we have to be like it even talks about the uh, ten virgin, the worship team, please come up. Uh, worship, uh, ten virgins, five were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones did not prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. The oil ran out. But the wise ones endured till the very end. They did not stray from the purpose that they were given, which was to wait. They all slept, but five were ready. Right? We all have responsibilities in this world that we have to carry on. But underneath that, while that we're doing, fulfilling those responsibilities, do we have the oil keeping our lamps bright? Are we wise? Uh, I'm going to read one more verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, 1. Who is as the wise man who knows the interpretation of the thing? A man's wisdom, see, the same thing. A man's wisdom makes his face to shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. 
This is our wisdom while on earth to choose the paths of God, to choose righteousness, to live worthy of his calling. This wisdom makes our face to shine in eternity. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that what is our light affliction is for a momentary time. It builds an eternal weight of glory. Our glory in eternity is determined by our righteousness here. So let us not waste our time while on earth. Live for the glory of Christ. And when I say all of this, I didn't mean to, you know, bring, uh, again, bring down the mood or anything. But I wanted to turn your attention to the glory that we're waiting for, the hope of our calling. Amen. The eternal hope of the coming of Christ to be with Him. To, as it says, we will reign with Christ. We will rule with Him. As we sang earlier, that we will rule with Him in eternity. Amen. And let that be the driving force of our life on earth. Man, may we judge righteous judgments. May His name be glorified.